Good evening, everybody. We're just about ready to get started, so fill your plates up and get a chair. They aren't moving. Okay. Well, I said we'd start at 7, and it's a little bit after, so let us get going. I really thank you all for being here. I really thought, you know, after I put out everything and said it started at 7, that I better start a couple minutes later just in case, you know. But please feel free to get up, grab something to eat, do whatever you need. Uh, the washrooms are behind the wall in the back. And uh, so let's, let's get going. I, I am just excited about Colin Bede in town. And, you know, he's been doing a tour all over the country, but uh, here in Washington State, and he's been showing his movie, the latest one, Wait Till It's Free. But how many of you come to movie night quite often? So we figured that it would be a lot more fun tonight for him to sort of talk about himself and why it is he does what he does and how he picks his subjects and uh, some of the more interesting things that have happened to us, to him on these uh, journeys of making documentaries. And you know, when I went to his website, I found out that he has three others that we haven't shown at movie night. So pretty crazy. So, hey, this, hey, this is sort of fun. Yeah, I, hey, now, now, I, now I'll know what to be showing, you know. About four years ago, it was before the election, and they had a uh, large, I think every school district was asking for a lot of money in their bond and levy issues. And so we started uh, actually a weekly meeting at movie night uh, doing nothing but educational things. So we showed three films, and then at the, on the last week, we had a panel of educators. And at that point, indoctrination wasn't out yet. So we showed a movie called Flunked, uh, The Cartel, and Waiting for Superman. And then we had our, uh, our panel. And uh, fortunately, a lot of those bond issues, uh, levy issues, didn't pass so that we felt like we had at least accomplished something. And then a little later, indoctrination came out. And I've got to tell you, one movie accomplished a thousand percent more than the three movies in our panel as far as really explaining what's happened to our education system. And then uh, we had Wait Till It's Free just a couple months ago. Actually, we were supposed to show it in November. Like I said, we've been doing movie night for five years, a little over five years. First time we forgot the DVD and left it at home. <laughs> That was crazy. And unfortunately, Jeff had brought a DVD with him, so we were able to fill in and show something else, and then we showed Wait Till It's Free a couple months later. Also an excellent documentary. Uh, they are for sale here. Uh, and I mean, I've heard, you know, buy one for one price and get two for another. Uh, this is buy one for $15, but if you buy both, it's only $20. So a heck of a deal. And honestly, if you have children, grandchildren, no people that have children, you definitely need to put indoctrination in your library, uh, honestly. Uh, Matt Shea was going to be here and introduced, but he isn't. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask Jeff Baxter to please come up and start our evening. And here's Jeff. Thank you. Uh, I want to first acknowledge a couple people here in the room. First of all, Rob Chase, our county treasurer, would you please stand? <laughs> Rob's one of my heroes and a great patriot. And we have Rod Higgins, who's on the Spokane Valley City Council. Rod. And then we have Mr. Mike Fagan, who's the Spokane City Council, the only right person, right level-headed person there. And then we have Sam Reed, will you please stand up? Sam Reed is running wood. this wood. year. Wood. 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 Don't say Sam that. Wood. <laughs> Sam Wood is in the back. How did I say that? <laughs> Better look at my notes. So Sam Wood is running at Ben Wick. Um, for what position is it? Spokane Valley City Council position six. Position six, okay. Ben Wick position. Okay. So uh, he is off to a great start. He's got a lot of help with him and he's, he just came in to me earlier 
and he was just saying how surprised he is how people are coming out of the woodwork wanting to help, wanting to volunteer, wanting to put up signs, wanting the doorbell. And so that's very exciting and I'm proud of all you guys. So I get the very honor, special honor tonight of introducing Colin Gunn. You ever meet somebody which doesn't happen that rare in your life? That you talk to somebody on the phone or you meet somebody in person and within seconds of talking to them either on the phone or in person, you know that they're going to be lifelong friends? You ever met somebody like that? A lot of people don't. I've only met just a few, and I mean just a few. Colin is one of those gentlemen that I talked to him on the phone a number of times. We had him on Civil Can's Right Perspective a couple different times, uh, actually a few different times. And uh, I just knew by talking with him, by his attitude, by his fluctuations in his voice, by his, his worldview, that we were going to be lifelong friends. And so I'm very honored to introduce him. But let me read a little bit about his bio here. And before I start that, if you have a notepad or a pen or an iPhone that you can make a note off of, I want you to write this down. It's a 10-minute video on YouTube. And this will show you where Colin is coming from, from Ronald Reagan. It's called Operation Coffee Cup. It's a 10-minute YouTube vid video. It's very simple to remember, Operation Coffee Cup. And it will blow your mind. That was done, folks, in 1961. That wasn't done 30 years ago, it was done in 1961. And Colin is nailing it through this movie tonight and what he's gonna be talking about. Anyway, Colin is an award-winning writer, producer, and director, and an accomplished animator. He's also an actor, but he's not willing to admit that. But I found that earlier. His previous films include Shaky Town, a film about San, Fr San Francisco, homosexual politics, and the monstrous regiment of women, a documentary that, and, the, and the harmful effects of feminism. He most recently co-directed, wrote, and produced the doctor, doctor, uh, documentaries Indoctrination, which uh, he won several national awards for, by the way, uh, which uh, uh, it's Indoctrination, Public Schools and the, and the Decline of Christianity in America, and Captivated, Finding Freedom in Media, cult, cult, cap, Captive Culture. He also acted as executive producer in Act Like Men, a Titanic lesson in manliness. And I think that's something probably all of us need to listen in. He recently completed a new length feature documentary, which he's going to be covering tonight as well, on America Healthcare called Wait Till It's Free, which he also won several national awards for. So that's two in a row. Very few people in the country have two national awards. Uh, that they've won several awards for in a road documentary. So he's originally from Hamilton, Scotland. Colin, Colin lives with his family of, of nine kids and wife in Texas. And uh, his first movie was Shaky Town, produced in 2003 and 2004. It took him two years to produce it. And I just want to welcome Colin Gunn. Thank you. Am I using the microphone? Okay, great. You can hear me. I'm going to stand up here because I'm the shortest guy in the room. I mean, you got to look at me. I, uh, I am a documentary filmmaker, which is a sort of weird job to end up having. Um, I, I, I think it's a combination of my two favorite things, which is I, I'm from an arts background, and I'm also Scottish, so I like to argue with people, and this is where the two, <laughs> two mesh perfectly. And um, I'm also an American uh, citizen now, so I'm... Uh, um, which means I'm, I'm a slightly better sort of American because I came here by choice, not by accident of birth, you know. So I'm a voluntary American, not just an accidental American. So, um, and I did come here by choice. I ended up meeting my wife in New York City and fell in love with her and New York City and, and America, but I was already predisposed to the values that you guys have here, and that is the values that I believe in, and that is your amazing Christian heritage, as well as your love for liberty, and that is the primary idea behind the documentary films that I've been making. So, the two main films, we've run out of all of our other films, but we have these two, and actually these are the ones, we, but we, the reason we have some of these left is we brought a lot more of these, because these are the two main films um, that we've made. And the reason we make documentary films, what documentary films can do that you can't, and not to put any of you down because there's some real politically savvy people here in this room, and those politically savvy people 
like Jeff will have their you know five minute elevator speech on every single subject memorized and they're able to just you know deliver it at a drop of a hat well that's good but it's not good enough and what is good are documentary films and not just as a documentary filmmaker saying that but what documentary films do is it enables you to deliver the full story, the total argument against the issue that you're dealing with, and in this case is the public school system, and in this case is socialized medicine, the impact of socialized medicine. Um, and what we do is something which I would argue is almost a, well, is a biblical idea. In the Bible, if you want to tr prove that something is true, there's a requirement on you to do that, and that is to bring two or three witnesses to testify to the truthfulness of a matter, the Bible says, you bring two or three witnesses. Well, in our films, we bring 30 witnesses. We bring people that testify to our argument. So I can be a blowhard, you know, Scott, just telling you my opinion. Where does that take you all? You know, it might get your radio show, but it's not going to convince a lot of people. Uh, what documentary films do is instead of me just talking and telling you my opinion, I go out and I find these witnesses. And these witnesses are crucial to make a proper case, a proper argument. And so we bring these people, and there's different sorts of witnesses. And what we're going to do in this talk, and it's, a, it's an interesting kind of talk, I hope, I hope it's not going to be completely confusing to you, but we're going to talk about both films at once. So we're going to go back and forwards, and it's going to be really easy, I think, because yellow is the color of indoctrination after the big yellow bus, so the screen will be yellow, and then green, hospital gown green <laughs> for the, for the wait till it's free story. And so we're gonna go back and forwards, but I'm gonna explain to you documentary filmmaking, because I think not all of you will end up making documentary films, um, but it's good for you to understand their usefulness as a tool, because if you're an activist, which I think is why a lot of you are here, the documentary film will solve a lot of your problems in terms of delivering the message that you want to present to others. What I'm going to do, just to start off here, is to um, get my computer up and running, type in my password, and I'm going to start by playing um, the, this is the title of the talk, Documentary Filmmaking for Faith and Liberty, yellow screen, so that means we're going to, you're going to see the indoctrination trailer first. You're going to see, uh, I'm going to show you both trailers. The interesting thing about trailers is they're kind of fun to edit, but they're torture to edit. So when we go shoot a film, we, we film 50 hours of footage, at least. And then we edit it all down to, in the case of Wait Till It's Free, 83 minutes, and Dr. Nation, 102 minutes. We edit it all down, so we're selectively creating this very best argument, including the visual aspect of the argument, which we'll talk about as well. And then, when we make a trailer, we take that, those 83 minutes and edit it down to two and a half minutes. And it is absolutely brutal to go from 50 hours down to this tiny little section. But what we're doing is we're refining the very most important points with the most impact and leverage. And it's often emotional leverage. Our films are designed to entertain and convince and bring people along. We don't want to beat people over the head. We're there to give them the key message, and you'll see that from this trailer for indoctrination. I'm going to play that first. Oops. I want to see a child in every public school in America who is trained as a witness for Jesus Christ. When you send that child off to school today, you're sending them into a pagan society. And in the studies are showing that there's virtually no discernible difference between the church and the world. At what point is Southern Baptist going to rise up and say, enough is enough? Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. We've got to do something different. The schools are failing. I'll go to six or seven days a week, not just Monday through Friday. You're not going to be painting, okay? You're going to be writing down whatever comes to your mind when you hear the word gay or when you hear the word lesbian. So nothing's right or wrong There's in no this right. either? That's right. They are stealing our children. But because they are leaving the body of the child with us, we don't even know what's happening. 
If I had my way, government education would be brought to a halt. Trying to fix public education is like trying to teach a pig how to dance. You get dirty, the pig gets mad. Turning your children over to total strangers and having those strangers work on your child's mind, it's a mad idea. Public schools have become a criminal enterprise. Parents are willing to admit that there are these problems and yet believe that their children will somehow escape. They won't. And it may have taken a school shooting to wake us up, to see the danger, but that's a very small danger compared to all the other things that go on that can destroy our children. Everything exists to proclaim the glory of God. And the one place where we send our kids seven hours a day is a place where God's name can't be mentioned. It's not indoctrination, it's insanity. So that's the trailer for our film, Indoctrination. As you can tell by the trailer, what we did was we drove across the country in a big yellow bus. And, uh, you know, this symbol of the American education system. Um, our goal in the film is incessantly mention some of the other films that are out there. And um, I would argue they're, they're pretty disappointing films. Most of the reason filmmakers make, or the mistake at least, that a lot of the main filmmakers uh, the, the way they design their films is they design them for political consequences. They make this error of focusing too much on politics. Politics is great and we should absolutely be involved in the political aspects that relate to both of our films. But essentially we believe in a bigger picture and in terms of the education system, we believe the simplest answer and the correct answer is to leave the system. That's the first thing and then we build up our independent Christian uh, education system, homeschooling and private schooling, uh, and that's been remarkably successful. All of the other ones want to fix the problem, and we sort of explain that in the film. This film, wait till it's free, and uh, there's so much in common. I think we'll go into that in, in bits and pieces about the commonality between the two films in, in terms of the idea, but I'm going to play the trailer. If you haven't seen it, this is it. In a few moments, when I sign this bill, health insurance reform becomes law in the United States of America. The left in America has been trying for 50 years to get control of the health care system. Moving towards a single-payer system could very well make sense. I'm all for a single-payer system. I want it single-payer. Instead of having a single-payer or a national health service style plan, it often ends up being I said, I don't know, seven, eight thousand dollars, and she said, no, it's twenty thousand dollars. The buyer doesn't know what the prices are. You can't do anything about the prices, even if he knows what the prices are. The American system is barely capitalistic at all because there's so much distortion to the system by how involved the government already is in the whole process. For some person to stick his Pinocchio nose between me and my patient, that person is an interloper. The market is just begging and pleading to help out, and yet all we get from Washington is obstructionism. When government comes up with a bad idea, there's no way to get rid of it. They don't solve the problems. Capitalism solves problems. The long-run solution to the U.S. fiscal problem is death panels and sales taxes. To say that there is no death panel may be naive, but I think worse than that, it's deceptive. The people who will suffer most when the government gains control, the children or the old people, these are the ones whose care will be rationed. Thank you, Planned Parenthood. God bless you. If the government can tell you that you have no religion in your business, if they can take away your faith, they can take away a lot of things. Military veterans are dying needlessly because of long waits at some U.S. veterans' hospitals. And if they died, they were just crossed off as if they had never shown up for care. So tell me, what do you think of the National Health Service? You're rubbish. The British have been subject to a confidence trick that their system is the best, when actually, it's either the worst or amongst the worst in the Western world. Elderly and vulnerable patients were left unwashed, unfed, and without fluids. Governments are not very good at running things. Why should we expect them to be any better at running hospitals? Don't imagine that if you go down this road, you're going to be able to change your mind later. We can say right now that the key issue is we do not want socialized medicine.
available now. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you some tips about filmmaking. You're not filmmakers. I think there's some here that have an interest in filmmaking and have maybe thought about making documentary films. We certainly are the sort of low-hanging fruit of the film world. And it's certainly the least glamorous sort of filmmaking you can do. But nonetheless, I think it's the best sort of film because it's the most direct and Christian filmmakers really struggle with uh, making films that aren't preachy, well, I get the opportunity to make a film that's actually, by ne definition, preachy. is a is an argument. It's a case that we are making, so we don't have to couch all our sto you know, st characters or our ideas with characters and just subtly put things in. We can just come out and, and express our opinion. But there's particular rules to filmmaking that we follow. So people think documentary films are made where we just pick up cameras and then we start filming things and people and then we edit it together and that's it. It's not like that at all. It's actually driven by film theory, and I didn't know anything about film theory, so if you see my old films, you'll realize that pretty quickly. Uh, and then I learned that you have to make these like feature films. There's a language to film that makes sense to people, and whether you know the language or not, well, you actually do know some of that language because you watch movies, so we all are aware of the structure of films to some extent. You're aware of how long they usually are. You're aware that there's usually a hero and there's usually a villain, and you're usually aware that the hero is going to be successful and the villain isn't, and of course people break those rules all the time, especially if you're Scorsese or someone like that, they can do what he wants, but generally speaking most filmmakers follow the rules, and they follow the rules not just because it's the easiest thing to do, it's because there's a language that people understand and you're trying to communicate to them through film. So when we make our films, we have, uh, and I've listed some of them here, character, premise, and tone. In, in terms of character, for our film, um, we follow this pattern in indoctrination where we do have an antagonist and a protagonist, and kind of unusually, I am the protagonist, not a hero per se, but the main character. I'm the voice that you will hear throughout the film as the narrator, and I'm the person you will see going and doing things, just like you saw in the trailer. And then there's the antagonist, the evil villain. Does anyone have any idea what the evil villain is in our film? Does anyone know? Government. The government represented by what? Obama. No. The big <laughs> yellow bus is the villain in our film. The reason I do the big, yellow, the, the, the big yellow bus is the villain in our film is that representationally, when, we, when I, as an outsider, choosing to be an American, remember, came over here and saw the big yellow bus, it speaks of collectivism. It's, if you go to North Korea and everyone is wearing the same jumpsuit, it speaks to a dictatorship or a hierarchy that dictates something about that culture. The big yellow bus says that too, and that's what I noticed. So the yellow bus became the antagonist, the enemy, and I'm going to show a clip that sort of explains that. Looking back at my public schooling brings back many memories, both good and bad. When I remember some of the bad things from those years, the bullying, the dreary classrooms, and even the bad influences of some of my peers, I start to think of the alternatives to public education that weren't readily available to my parents' generation. As a kid, when Emily and I started having our own my kids, not we had to decide what we wanted to do for them. We wanted the very best for them. We wanted to raise them in the faith and protect them from some of the things we had been exposed to. So we decided to educate them at home. Now I know that parents who send their children to public schools love their children too and want the very best for them as well. But what is it that parents should expect by putting them on the bus today? Okay, so what I'm doing there is uh, setting the character, so that's near the start of the film. You're seeing the bus, it's going to have meaning, which comes out later on, you'll, I think you'll see another clip of that. Um, but what I'm trying to do is establish me as the main character, and the way to do that, and this is a, a, just a lesson in terms of making an argument, is that I'm trying to genuinely be winsome in the sense that I'm trying to make people know my attitude towards them. And that's very important in making a debate, when you approach someone, you approach them in the most generous way way possible, which is, about, which is without assumptions about who they actually are. And if you approach an argument with someone initially thinking that that person's an idiot and you express that to them, now I'm not saying that they're not an idiot, you don't know at this stage, but you're going to talk to them and you're going to show them respect and that's what we're trying to do. We don't know who our audience is, so I'm presenting myself as that character, but I'm saying several things there. One, I went to public schools. So there's sort of a shared experience. So it's not out of I, you know, I'm privileged in being private schooled and all the rest of it. Um, although I am kind of privileged, and I was private schooled, but I, well, I did go to public schools too. And then uh, I'm also setting the 
the, the playing field for the debate, which is, I know that you love your kids too, so if you caught that in that segment there, I'm saying to them, I know you love your kids too, but there's some information that you need to know. So instead of sit, come, making a film uh, from the homeschoolers saying, all oh, you public schoolers are fools for using the public schools, we don't want to do that at all. We want to assume the very best of the people now. There may be people being foolish using the public schools, but we're not ever going to assume that of our audience. Um, the premise is the, the driving force and then the tone. That's what I'm talking about there, where we're setting this tone of the film. And you're going to see how we do that and wait till it's free right here. So this is the story. As Americans, all of us face these problems. Even if you have insurance, you can lose it. What if tomorrow you start tasting cilantro? My name is Colin Gunn. I'm from Scotland, although I became a US citizen a few years ago. I love it here, but one thing I know I don't love is the way that we do healthcare. First, why is it so expensive? After all, like food, it's a common necessity and there's certainly no shortage of that in America. I'm going to share with you what I've learned traveling across America asking questions about healthcare and then across the ocean as I explore the socialized medicine in my home country. And while the word free might be music to the ears of a Scotsman, the truth is everything comes at a cost. And to paraphrase P.G. O'Rourke, if you think healthcare is unaffordable now, wait till it's free. Okay, so that's, you know, a, a clip less than a minute and it's setting up the idea of the film. Uh, it's setting up a scenario, which I'll explain in a minute, that's based on the design of the film. Um, but you're hearing one thing that's really important. I'm an American citizen, so I'm coming as a critique, as a as an outsider, and that's the benefit I have as a filmmaker. I'm an outsider and, and an insider too, so I understand the American system, but I'm also be able to look at it from the outside to some extent, which was more true for indoctrination, as I mentioned. I noticed the yellow bus being a significant issue, but also I'm British, so I'm able or Scottish to go, I'm able to say, no, I have this other experience of socialized medicine and I'm going to, uh, you, you got a hint of what is coming. So that's what we're trying to set up there. Now we're going to talk a little bit about design. Um, filmmakers, when they make documentaries, often fail on this and they end up making documentaries that are just talking heads. They're completely absence of um, any aesthetics or any communication other than just people talking. And when I watch my films, we have people talking almost all the time, but behind them we have music, but in front of your eyes you're seeing visuals, and those visuals have meaning, and that's sort of my art background of understanding that uh, ideas are largely presented to us by um, the visuals that we see, these big ideas, so the big yellow bus being part of that design, and I'm going to show you a, a, an example of why it brings extra meaning to the story uh, when we use something by analogy. So I'm going to play this clip. We're just, uh, our mechanic is uh, inspecting the bus, so we're just going to see if we can get on the road in the next five minutes. With, uh, can we continue just patching the system up to keep it rolling along, or are some more radical steps necessary? It's hard for me to understand why Christian leaders are still calling for the return of the Bible, prayer, or creation in the government schools. All right. Okay, so the big yellow bus has that image. It's iconic, it works really well. The, what I'm doing there as I'm presenting the yellow bus is the character, the protagonist, and of course what happens is this bus goes along, it starts to break down. By analogy, I'm saying I'm gonna patch it up and fix it, and then if you've seen the film, it progresses to another part of the narrative in relation to the bus. I don't wanna spoil the movie, what happens to the bus, but you could make a guess or two. And so that's using art to communicate a meaning. It's using color significantly to communicate a meaning, a meaning uh, that you can't do just by talking to people. And that's the beauty of documentary films. We do the same for the, design, the diner, and I'll explain the, the reason for that in a second, why we decided to use And for that. some person or entity to stick his Pinocchio nose between me and my employer, my individual patient, that person or entity is an interloper. The interloper could be anyone who interferes in the actions of a doctor or the choices of a patient. It could be the government or any meddlesome third party that tries to interrupt or control medical decisions. <laughs> With the countless agencies, the multi-layers of bureaucracy, the codes and the risk of being sued all contribute to a misery for the doctors trying to just do their job. 
it is our individual responsibility, parenthesis, not the responsibility of government to watch out for other folks. Okay, so what we have there is another visual metaphor that we're using, and we had actors there. It's, it was kind of funny when we were shooting that because if you know anything about uh, being on set, everything is fake. The food was cooked the day before, and so all of these actors had to pretend to eat these cold uh, fries repeatedly for multiple takes, and they hated me for it. But we got the shot, and what we're doing, and what we're doing with this film. So when we we decided to make a film on healthcare. We immediately thought, oh, we need to do gurneys and waiting rooms and surgeries, uh, the, the operating rooms and, uh, you know, the machine that goes ping and EKGs and all the rest of it. And that'll be our artistic imagery for the film. So we went out and watched other documentaries in healthcare, and that's all they did. All of them that did all of those images. It was the easiest option. I decided for this film we needed another a metaphor or idea, and I realized that the best opportunity was the American diner. And I love American diners. I think they're amazing, and they speak to me of capitalism, the free market. What that, what they do, you know, you can get a coffee at three in the morning in the middle of nowhere at a diner because of capitalism, because of the free market. And that's a wonderful system that we have here. And what I want to do with this story of healthcare is I want to take the, the confusion about the way we pay for healthcare and separate it and put it in another context. And that is the context of the American diner. First, as well, it's an American story. So that's making it very clear that this is an, an American icon and that's the, the situation that we're going to, uh, where all these characters are going to be. So throughout the whole film, we explain rationing of care. We explain, in this case, the intervention of third party or the government into people's lives. And uh, the, the metaphor really works from start to end. And so, the, in a sense, the, it's a positive character, unlike the bus in the film. Now, um, back to indoct indoctrination. Um, I mentioned that the, we have these witnesses, so I see myself as like I always fancied myself as a lawyer. And uh, you go in the courtroom and you stand before the jury and you get your great speech planned and uh, you you've get these uh, witnesses that come in and uh, the, you realize that when you present witnesses to a jury, I'm just, I don't know anything about court systems, but so I don't actually know, but this is how I imagine it from the television. You bring these eyewitnesses in and they're going to make this great case uh, for you and what you need is a plurality of, of witnesses and the reason for that in our films is we have different types of people so we're very considerate of the audience because different things will work with different people. People aren't the same so you have men and women and you have different ethnicities and different value systems and you want to appeal to a broader audience. You want to make sure that you have the woman's voice represented. You want to make sure that all of the people you enter in your interview in the film aren't all, you know, middle class white guys. You know, you want to make sure that you have a voice that speaks to a broad audience. Um, in terms of the, the different stories that we have, uh, in terms of the eyewitness, I think the eyewitness has the most leverage for the reason that I think stories affect people in, emotion, in an emotional way better than just straight facts, <laughs> you know. So people debate facts, but when you present them with a story and there's an emotional tie into that story, you can actually see the effect of it in a real way, in a way that they attach themselves, because we naturally, that's why we all enjoy watching movies. We don't watch them passively. When we watch a movie, we immediately engage ourselves with the characters that we're watching. We're, you know, Indiana Jones, or we're <laughs> all those characters on the screen. We become that to a small extent in our imaginations, but it becomes, in a sense, really real to us. So when we make documentary films, we're capitalizing on that same principle. And so we're bringing eyewitnesses, and we're picking those eyewitnesses. It's not random that we find these people, and we do reject people that aren't as good a witness. We reject them on the way they look, or the way they sound, or the way they are, and pick the very best ones. So you remember, we're doing all these interviews, this, these 50 hours, and we're throwing most of it away eventually. We're picking the very best witnesses to bring before this jury. In this case, we found teachers, and the teacher's case is particularly important when we talk about the public schools. What the teacher's opinions are, so you know, the funny statistic about um, public school Christian teachers is that the private school at a higher rate than the rest of the population. They effectively don't eat their own dog food, if you're going to use that term. You know, eating, the, eating your own dog food is where you, you know, if you work for Microsoft, you better not be sitting, have an iPhone sitting on your desk. You will get into trouble. And 
But that's effectively what the teachers are doing by not using the public schools, just like who else doesn't use the public schools? Well, Barack Obama is a good example, and other politicians who also at a higher rate than the rest of the population are less likely to use the public schools. So what do they know? Well, the teachers actually do know what happens, and here's an eyewitness testimony from a teacher. Parents, they want to think that their teachers are doing good, but they don't know what really goes on inside of the classroom. And while the public school system teaches morals, we've, we're told that that's the most important thing that we teach, that that is the plate that all of the subjects, everything else goes on. But what the public school system has done is taken Christ out from the morals. And so they've taken the foundation that the morals are based on away. So that's an eyewitness testimony from a teacher. And, you know, if you think about who we chose there, now there's a sense where we don't control everything in a documentary. We make plans. I tell people when you, you make a documentary, you write a script, and then you shoot according to that script, and then you throw the script away because the stuff you get is much better than you ever anticipated, and the people you interview are smarter and know more than you, so it changes everything about what you thought the film would be, but it's always for the better. And so we get these eyewitnesses and we, we, you know, we've shot as many interviews as we throw away, but that's a great example where she's perfect because she is that perfect teacher. She's young and attractive and friendly and nice and a Christian. And she, if anyone is going to be the teacher you're going to want to have, she's going to be the one. And so you take your kids to her and of course what she telling you in our film, don't leave your kids in the public school. So that's, that's why the film has so much more significant leverage than me telling you that. So if I tell you that, don't send your kids to public schools, does not, her, her leverage, her ability to communicate the message is so much more powerful. Um, so for the healthcare film, um, the story is about patience. It's not just about patience as we discovered when we actually dug deep into the, the story as we were doing all our research. We thought it was initially about the patients and the mistake most documentaries on healthcare have made is they make it entirely about the patients. It's not. It's about the patients and the doctors and it's about their relationship. The doctor-patient relationship is the essence of what healthcare actually is, both on the economic level and the actual health level, healthcare level. That is the meaningful relationship and so that's what we're talking about. But we needed to find sympathetic stories from patients. So this is what we found for, for Wait Till It's Free. We had to have an MRI for Claudia. They gave me a quote of about $1,800 for that. Then I called the hospital to see if how much they would charge, and they said it'd be about $3,000. So we decided to go ahead and go to the hospital. My wife called me up after the MRI, and she'd gotten the bill, and she says, guess what the bill is? And uh, I said, you know, from her tone of voice, I knew it was high, so I said, I don't know, seven, dollars $8,000? And she said, no, it's $20,000. <laughs> we have a radiologist bill, which wasn't even included in the $20,000. Then we had the anesthesiologist, which was another bill as well. So it was an expensive procedure. <laughs> Your bills totaled $300,000 at the end of it all from her daughter being born with spina bifida, which of course we would say is an act of God, you know, one of those illnesses that's not wished, you don't wish upon yourself, it's something that happens. And so you can see we have this story developing in the film, which we do actually resolve about that, uh, that story of the significantly high bills that relate to health care. And of course, just saying, oh, there's high bills in health care and that's a problem. Well, it doesn't mean as much until you look at the, look at the child. <laughs> so you get a video of the little cute kid and then you see the mom and you see them in a situation where you can evaluate who they are, you can tell they're not super wealthy in any way, and then you see the, the husband, and the, he's a regular guy, so you're, when you have a regular guy on screen, well, everyone that's a regular guy goes, hey, I'm a regular guy too, and so it starts to be meaningful to the people watching it, that's how it works. So um, the experts are this amazing category of people, I always joke that if you want to meet all of your heroes, just pretend you're making a documentary film, and you can call them up, and I've got to meet Ron Paul, and all these great people, and all these, all these people I'm a fan of. Uh, John Taylor Gatto is one of, I, you know, if you've been in the homeschooling world for, for a while, you will come across his name. He, was, he is an absolute legend 
in the homeschooling world because very early on he was calling out he, he's he's actually an expert witness and an eyewitness in a real way and that's doubling down in his value because his uh, he was a teacher teacher of the year in new york state new york city in the same year and also uh, an expert witness having written multiple books about the subject so to get john taylor gatto in your film on education is is a huge win and by the way we chase people down <laughs> to get interviews because um sometimes it can be the best part of a year to finally get an interview set up because you're you're making phone calls and it's always busy important people and then you're never talking to them you're talking to someone who kind of knows them and it's you know it's a long process and most of what i do is is pretty boring the emails and phone calls that's pretty much what a, a documentary film director does John Gatto teaches eighth graders. Though he's been teaching in New York City schools for 26 years, he disdains grades, tests, and conventional ways of teaching. He'd rather not teach in the classroom, but the school requires him to four days a week. Confining people in rooms and monitoring every minute of their lives in those rooms couldn't possibly fit into any definition of education that's come from any corner of the world. None. So let's very quickly review what these might be. I don't teach the kids that education's bad. I say that schooling's bad. We spent a long time studying the great people who had never gone to school and the great Americans who had never gone to school. George Washington had two years, period. They had no more time to waste. Thomas Jefferson had zero. They had no schooling. They had great education. <laughs> so it's amazing to see that. You see the young John Taylor Gatto. So you see he's been at it for a while. So it adds extra meaning there. And then, you know, you hear his voice and, and uh, also an amazing character speaking with some, speaking with authority and gentleness in a real way. So a, a very, just an amazing character to have. Uh, we went to, on, on health care, we started looking at the experts and as we were writing the, the script for the film, uh, Stephen Brill popped up and I had not heard of him before, uh, but all of a sudden he's all over the media. He wrote an article in Newsweek called Bitter Pill and it was on the subject of our movie, or at least the start of our movie, when we started to talk about the big bills. And so we were like, well, you know, can we get this guy because there's, you know, we are Christian conservatives and he's not a Christian or conservative as far as I know he might be, but I don't think so. Anyway, we thought we got to get this guy because he's brilliant. He really is brilliant. And the, the whole essay, it was the first time uh, the magazine Time had published one article for the whole issue. It was such an important article um, that they didn't want to divide it up and rightly so. It was the number one whistleblower article, a uh, piece of journalism that was absolutely made him or made me realize this is the guy so valuable um so we uh got him on the phone which is amazing i mean you see someone on the television and you're like and he was on the daily show i think i've got a clip of that he's on the daily show and then the next day i'm like i gotta get that guy on our, in our documentary and the next day you're calling him and you're talking to him and some people are accessible some people are distant but he was very accessible and very gracious to us to grant us an interview we just had to go to new york to do it which is fine i can't complain about going to new york and uh, this is stephen brill He's a different kind of He's personality. The program, Stephen Brill. The price for everything associated with health care is just way too high in terms of a comparison of what any other country spends, often to produce better results than we produce in the United States. In any kind of real marketplace, the buyer has some uh, relevant balance of power over the seller, but in the healthcare marketplace, the buyer has no power. The buyer doesn't know what the prices are um, and can't do anything about the prices even if he knows what the prices are. Cool stuff. You know, you get a guy like that in your film. Um, just levels of authenticity. You know, he's got the jacket off and the suspenders. <laughs> he looks like a hot shot because he is a hot shot. Um, he's a big deal. So, and you see New York in, in the background, so you're obviously up the high level, and you, it just it adds the, this meaning to the film, not to mention his amazing words, direct words about this issue. Um, fantastic. So, um, history is really important. It's not as important to everybody as it is to me, at least, or and most people like me who really value history. There's a lot of people that 
If it doesn't have any leverage with, we've found, we'll show them a history clip and we'll, well, I don't care, what is, how does this affect me now? They don't realize that where everything came from is everything to do with what they have now. And so we had to go out and find uh, these uh, connections to history. And if you've seen indoctrination, it's all about the uh, argument, and this, this, this is true, and wait till it's free. We have more history in uh, indoctrination, which made it a bit longer, uh, and that is, uh, we had actually had a timeline where this yellow bus would plot along uh, the timeline, and all the ideologues would jump on the bus. So you had, uh, you'll see that at the end of this clip, but you had, you know, Karl Marx and uh, you know, all these bad guys, <laughs> Darwin and all, everyone, jumping on the bus to prove a point. And uh, this is uh, Samuel Blumenfeld, and he's our history expert. So that was the case that we're trying to make here. A state government education system is a socialist system. Mm -hmm. Now, people don't realize that socialism was uh, an ideology in this country as early as the 1820s. And it was brought to this country by Robert Owen, who believed that the cause of all of our problems was religion, and that children could be educated in such a way without religion to become anything you wanted. Okay, so uh, that was a good situation um, where we, we interviewed them outside. We're always trying to change up the way we do interviews, so some of them are standing up. Uh, some of them are sitting down in a, with a bookcase behind them, but we, every single interview we try and make it different but we also try and have a, a historical or reason for it we're actually with Samuel Blumenfeld we're right next to the first public school in America so that was the situation we were there um, I'm going to show you a little clip of Operation Coffee Cup uh, which uh, Jeff mentioned earlier and I think it's really valuable you know it was one of the first viral campaigns in America where they came along and they made this this record this old record that they sent out to everybody uh, to sh you know play in little groups and it was a little campaign um, to win uh, Americans over to protect their health care liberty. So I'll play this clip here. It's, on, it's uh, Ronald Reagan talking about Operation Coffee Cup from 1961. We can say right now that we want no further encroachment on these individual liberties and freedoms. And at the moment, the key issue is we do not want socialized medicine. Tell him that you believe in government economy and fiscal responsibility, that you know that governments don't tax to get the money they need, governments will always find a need for the money they get, and that you demand the continuation of our traditional free enterprise system. And behind it will come other federal programs that will invade every area of freedom as we have known it in this country, until one day we will awake to find that we have socialism. And if you don't do this, and if I don't do it, one of these days, you and I are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Brilliant, isn't it? So it's great to hear his voice, you know, fantastic words on that issue of the problem of socialized medicine. So we're adding connections there to someone that a lot of conservatives respect. But it's also the point in that this battle has been going on since 1961. In fact, there's only, we mentioned a lot more history before 1961, so this is a deep story, and we're now closer to the end game with Obamacare and the rest of it. So the point there, to an extent, is you can fix Obamacare, but that doesn't fix the whole thing, because there's deep issues in, health, uh, in the changes to health care in America. So um, the one thing I want to talk about in relation to political agenda, this is very important, because the mistake that people make is that if we uh, hand things over to the government, well, it doesn't really change anything. It just is paid for differently. So there's kind of a personal advantage if the government pays for it for things for you. But my argument is that is not true. And whenever the government engages in anything that used to be in the free market, nationalizes it, and takes control of it, it will immediately serve its own ends. So what used to serve a particular purpose, which might have been education or health care in the free mar market, it twists it around to pushing a political process through health care uh, and through indoctrination. So this is uh, the uh, political agenda, which you mentioned, that's the school unions. The unions are the people who brought us a weekend and an eight-hour workday. If we don't do this now, our children will not have a weekend. This is for the 
again. Most teachers say they're doing it for the kids and not for the money. But then they always protest for two things. Fewer kids and more money. What do you want? What do you want? Parents need to be aware that many teachers in America are members of liberal unions that clearly despise conservative and Christian values. Why are these conservative and right-wing picking on NEA and its affiliates? It's not because we have a vision of a great public school for every child. NEA and its affiliates are effective advocates because we have power. power. Yep. So, so the, the point is, is that when the politicians take over, it starts to serve the political process. And um, that happens in healthcare as well. Um, it, it's nice to think the government can just pay for everything, but it, healthcare, as it becomes politicized, becomes about the things that they value, and they, they're serving uh, their, themselves in relation to their values, and very much so abortion is a big part of that story. So this is a clip about abortion uh, on demand under socialized medicine. Please join me in welcoming the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Look out for the power of the feminists because uh, they completely control the Obama administration. He does whatever the feminists want. They want abortion and they want it paid for by the taxpayers. Because of the ACA, most insurance plans are now covering the cost of contraceptive care. He uh, believes that the government should control our lives and there's no way to have limited government and keep government out of our lives unless we make maintain the institution of the family. Thank you, Planned Parenthood. God bless you. So, startling that he would say that, isn't it? It shows how out of touch he is from reality, or at least the Christian worldview. I don't think anyone would say God bless you to Planned Parenthood if they had any sense of uh, the faith anyway. Um, so stories have significant leverage, and I'm going to show you one story which I think is very powerful. That is the story of Brian Rohrbaugh. He is a father of one of the Columbine victims, and he's probably the most powerful, uh, it's certainly one of the most powerful parts of our movie, as he testifies to his personal responsibility, his purpose in participating in the film, and of course we had to win him over. He doesn't do a lot of media, and so he had to trust us, so he effectively interviewed us first before we, he agreed to be part of the film. But he added so much value. And the reason is, is that someone who has experienced that, he does something quite remarkable, and that is accept accountability for what happened to his son. Yes, his son was murdered, but he did send his kids to the public schools knowing the values and ideology of the people in the schools itself, which is what his reason for bringing that up and saying it that way is he's warning Christian parents that you are accountable when you send your kids to the public schools knowing what they teach. And if it affects their worldview and it affects their lives, not necessarily just because of school shootings, but if they lose their soul based on their change of philosophy, then it's a significant uh, responsibility on the parents. So him taking responsibility is a message to all parents everywhere. I guess not just for public schooling parents, but every, all of us. But in this story relating to public schools, I think Brian Rohrbach couldn't have said it better than, than he, he said it in the film. They had taken evolution much further than most people do. But if you stop and think through it, their logic was correct if evolution is true. And yet, it is taught in the school, and I put my son there. Even though I'm a Christian. So, when we talk about my son's murder, yes, it's right to condemn these two murderers. It's right to condemn the school system that taught these wicked things. But you must remember, I'm the one who put him there. And I'm the one who's responsible for his death. Okay, it's a very powerful testimony there from Brian Rohrbaugh. Um, 
what we try and do with our films is we, and that, that's a very hard thing to watch, what we try and do is bring people back from that, and this follows a structure of filmmaking where you take people down to sort of the level, the depths of the application of a particular worldview, and then you bring them out from it. So this happens in a lot of films where the hero goes along and then he's uh, you know, a victim of particular things, and then he's successful in the last act. We try and bring people up in the last act to try and uh, redeem the story to make it so that, that it's not just uh, this big negative thing. And the thing I hate about films where they just say, now go write your congressman, I hate all that sort of stuff. I want to give them genuine solutions to inform them, here's how you fix those things. So I'm going to play you a clip. We're getting near the last couple of clips here. But this is um, a story about a doctor finding their independence in healthcare. I walk in here with, with eight dozen eggs. I've got chickens. I bring Jules and the staff here eggs all the time. So I could go down the road to a big clinic and there'd be a number in there, but come in here. She's kind of like family. I really do love them and care about them. And I really feel like that comes back to me every day. I don't have a daily quota. I don't have a certain time period that each person has to fit into. I know some of my colleagues complain that they only have six minutes per patient. I don't think I could do very much with just six minutes. Everything a physician should be doing should be for the patient. It shouldn't be for Mr. Obama. It shouldn't be for the government. It should not be for an insurance company. It should be for the patient. Okay, so what Jules is doing there, it's an amazing story. Um, Jules uh, set up a cash-only clinic, and so she doesn't take Medicare or Medicaid. She doesn't take uh, insurance, and so people come to her clinic and pay cash. And what's interesting about that is there's people that would qualify for Medicaid, would rather show up and pay her cash instead of wait in line and get it for free. They'd rather come to her and get the service and, she, and get it with a smile. And that's what we notice about the cash-only doctors, because they're not dealing with all of the bureaucracy that government has put them under. They've set a, separated themselves from the system, and they're able to do their job simply. And that's what the solution is to the healthcare problem, restoring the doctor-patient relationship which is an amazing and wonderful thing and that's why we show uh, Jules there and she's a good example she's friendly and attractive and smiles unlike a lot of doctors that you might know <laughs> <laughs> so um, another solution is Christian charity so uh, I've talked about this quite a lot um, there's uh, the objectivists who are kind of about uh, the free market. We have a lot of agreements with them, but there's a misapplication when they have we don't have the complete picture when they get round to solutions. Because we would argue the solution is maximizing the free market, but that is not going to completely fix the problem. The Christian solution, as we know, because Jesus said the poor are always with us, but there is always going to be this responsibility towards the poor. Now. In maximizing the free market, you do a real gift for the poor because you give them first reduced costs, but you also give them the opportunity to leave poverty because it's not always the same people. People are poor and then they become unpoor and then they're poor again. And people are sometimes never poor or always poor, but mainly it's a very fluid group. So socialism and welfare is more likely to lock people into that group. That's the problem. So our opportunity is to get them out of that group and give them as many opportunities as the free market gives them that. But what, who, what about the people that are left? This is the big question that the left, left will ask. What about the poor? And we have an answer, and it is Christian charity. Genuine charity, not welfare. Welfare is terrible at redistributing wealth. They give it to the wrong people, and they lose half of the money in bureaucracy, and then and the rest of it goes to crony capitalists. It's a bad system. Genuine charity works brilliantly, and I'm going to show you an example of how it works. This church community has made it their responsibility to provide a service to the needy. The gratitude from all of the patients was obvious. What do you think of the doctors here? Fantastic. Really. She's, she's so terrific. Do they treat you well? Yes, they do. Everyone else does too. Who takes your information, who helps you with it out. Very, very good. Are you thankful for the clinic Yes, here? yes I am. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's a free medication, a free consultation, and I'm so happy and thank God. And I pray for the service, the Sarah Fatcher, because it helps a lot of people poor, not have insurance. My husband is sick long time ago, and they give the medicine, they give the doctors, 
good attention. The old nursery, everybody, those wonderful person. In me personal, in in my, in my I, I don't I don't have work right now. They help me with uh, shopping, uh, things for my baby. I I don't have words to say. God is good. Isn't that amazing? So they, they run a cash, uh, sorry, no, not cash, clinic. they run a free clinic for the genuinely needy, and it's a church, and they minister to the people in that population and bring them in and treat them for free. And these, I stood there all night filming all of the testimonials of people coming out, and it was just wonderful to hear their experiences of genuinely being loved by those people that ran that ministry effectively. And of course, the, one of the other important things to remember about healthcare is you only really fix people if you fix them body and soul. And that's what they're able to do with their ministry there is they bring these people in who are sometimes have problems that extend beyond just their immediate physical health. Obvious problems like alcoholism and other th uh, uh, things that are connected to their lifestyle and their choices and their spiritual condition and what they're able to do because they're doing what healthcare was originally intended to be, which is a marrying of uh, ministering because of the with along with the gospel. That's the purpose of, of all of that, and we lost all of that with the way we, we do healthcare now. Um, that is the end of the the clips there, um, and I think what the best thing to do. I, I hope I've given you enough about what we have been trying to do here with documentary films. I hope these clips were effective in communicating a message beyond what I have any ability to say. And so I really appreciate you coming out and I'm really thankful for the people that set this up. It's my privilege to come out and talk to you here in Spokane. It's my second time here and I think it's a wonderful place to come. So I appreciate that. Thank you for coming out. And what I'm going to do now, if we have time, is to do a Q&A. So I don't know if you have any questions uh, chambered. If you do, I will try and answer them before we end. Yeah. Yes. Uh, cash, excuse me, cash only clinics. Uh, are they on the move? Are they growing? Do you see them popping up all over? Yeah. So what's happening right now? I'm part of a ministry called Samaritan Ministries, and the way that works, it's a really good system. We mentioned in the film, and what happens there is you. Uh, go out with your dollars and you buy medical services and then the network of, of other Christians pay off your bills for you so you submit that bill as a need and then they send you checks through the mail so it's not like an insurance company. That has created a significant uh, demand on people that accept cash as a priority. If you go into a hospital as we mentioned in the film you're getting, you, the, the irony is is those that go in with the, uh, who are usually the poorest, the people with the least amount of economic leverage end up paying the largest bills and we explain why that happens in the film but that's what uh, Stephen Brill is largely talking about so the person who goes in um, without insurance and who also doesn't qualify for a government program will get a bill vastly beyond the people who go in who are treated by or on Medicare or Medicaid and also those that are uh, uh, covered by insurance so there's this big gap there uh, that we're trying to explain in our film um, so what that's driven is a lot of people are looking at cash op options, also high deductible policies, which are a, a bit more popular now because people are forced to buy insurance, so that's the one they're picking. And so there's a lot of people chasing medical services with, with actual cash rather than just paying a co-pay and just going in and uh, engaging that way. So, um, yes, your answer, yes, that's absolutely what we're seeing right now. The opportunity is there for the taking and I think a lot of doctors are seriously considering it. The reason they do it though is to connect, reconnect themselves with their patients so that they don't have that third party that intervenes and they're able to do the very best for their patients and work with a, out with the system that's really driving doctors into retirement. So uh, thankfully we're seeing a lot of these doctors find this path and dedicate, dedicating themselves to, to being a free market doctor which is essentially what they are. Um, any more questions? Um, yes, ma'am. So, someone commented here during that one of the questions of the film with the cash um, that is there a risk in the future with government, you know, Big Brother government, all that growing bigger, that they would cr clamp down on those doctors that are doing cash and say, oh, you can't do that anymore? Do we, should we be pre pre uh, looking um, pro proactively ahead of time saying, do we need an amendment, pop block amendment? Possibly. We don't always operate from worst case and we've got to be vigilant with government. Um, thankfully, we have had um, 
great success there. It's going to be, I think it's going to be hard for them to do, but you know, with politicians, you never know um, what they're, they have brewing and what vendetta. In fact, I was talking earlier about Samaritan Ministries and how this state tried to restrict Samaritan Ministries, and Senator Jeff Baxter was uh, fixed it, right? <laughs> and by political activism. So there's amazing opportunities there to protect your liberties. The best way to protect your liberties is actually to use the system. That's what happened with homeschoolers where it, you ended up getting to a tipping point where you got so many people doing it, it was actually hard, much, much harder now for the government to deal with what they hate, which is homeschoolers. To go after homeschoolers when there's homeschoolers who, well, congressmen who homeschool and senators and now celebrities and the, the Duggars and you know, people like that, where there's now a, an understood, so we reached a tipping point there. We haven't reached that tipping point, I think, in the cash-only doctor world. Um, so the best thing you can do is use them and encourage people to consider that route if you can. And I think, but I think it's it's working in their favour economically right now. As similar to the government schools getting worse and worse and worse, and people are forced to leave and find a private option. I think in healthcare we're going to see more of the same, where the the structure of the hospital system will serve more and more the another type of people and people will have to disengage and sometimes it'll be for moral reasons like we had to leave the public schools because of what they were teaching against Christianity it may be true for the hospital system where we have to say or the surgery system or, the, or any medical facility where we have to disengage because of what they're doing there's an argument for that in terms of insurance you know what does your insurance pay for do they pay does it pay for abortions and psychology and all other things that you might have an issue with in terms of worldview that's why an, another reason why people are using Samaritan ministries because they don't they they know their money's going to someone with needs genuine health needs the issue there is that uh, what we talk about when we're talking about health care is actually a very small thing broken legs and heart attacks when they're talking about health care they're talking about that big political agenda of all the things they want including abortions and contraception and a host of things that I could mention um, that the UK government does for free that are horrific and that's what they're thinking so we, we're talking about different things and so that's why disengaging going the cash route but going Samaritan ministries as an example is a really effective way to know that your health care dollars are actually used for genuine health care needs um, I'll come to you in a minute. Yes. Okay, you're going to uh, uh, just explain how the documentary works and everything. What's next? <laughs> well, I'll take suggestions if you ha if you know what I should do next. <laughs> and a few hands going up at the back there. Oh. Early learning. If you already got all the education uh, information, you have to start. With that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say because we, if every time we announce something and not do it, we look like idiots. So I don't want to just say that we. I don't want to say we have. We have three big ideas, and I could mention. Th I'll mention t them oh, to you privately. Yeah. No, no way. <laughs> so we're getting videotaped. So um, who's next? So uh, I'll, I'll, yes, sir. Uh, you've seen socialized medicine on both sides of the pond. Right. And lately, this one more reports that it's getting. It's terrible. Do you see it getting to the point where it gets so bad that the public will demand it goes back to you? way that worked? British people will never demand that it goes back to a free market system. What's happened over in the UK, and we go this into detail in the film, when I go over to the UK and I talk to Theodore Dalrymple, who's a British scholar, and a really great old British curmudgeon, and a free market guy, and then we talk to, talk to Daniel Hannan, who's known as the Ron Paul of Europe, he's, he's an amazing guy, uh, and they both talk about the reality of the healthcare system, and as you saw in the trailer there, uh, British people have this conception that it's a wonderful thing, but it's really one of the worst healthcare systems in the world. And what that means is they're uh, rationing care significantly. The victims of rationing is usually the elderly. And in our film, we talk about what's called the Liverpool Care Pathway, which is essentially involuntary, involuntary euthanasia for the elderly. So what that means is you take grandma into the hospital and uh, she's having an episode and a hard time and uh, by the end of the weekend she is gone and what the family doesn't realize they just thought it was grandma's time but the reality is is that the hospital actively participating in killing grandma the hospital itself was getting a bonus by the government for killing grandma because they got bonuses for putting people on what was called the liverpool care pathway which is understood as a palliative care program but is really a method of killing people 
because there is a fine line there, but if you take people's food and fluid away and inject them with enough morphine and they can't react to it and they're gone, that is it. So that's what happened in the UK with state-sponsored government euthanasia and the worst kind of euthanasia, involuntary euthanasia. So that's the form of rationing we see. And if you think about it, we've got 10,000 baby boomers retiring every single day in America. So we've got this mounting problem. What do we do with the elderly? In our film, the solution is Christians taking seriously the issue of elder care. And we take responsibility for grandma, just like we took responsibility for little Johnny and not putting him on the school bus. We say that as Christian families, we, it's our job, and then protect them. The problem in Britain is they're trusting grandma to the state, which is a deadly mistake. Um, another question? Um, we'll come with you first. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I'm a senior, and I'm finding that I don't get any recognition in the, this Obama thing. Right. And when I go to the doctor, I am getting a discount from the doctors now. So that's a good thing. But where I was going with this whole thing is that maybe if more of us paid cash for the services that we need, which are probably fewer than farther than closer, that we can make a point. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. So if you disengage from the system or any subsidized system and you go into the free market, it's very similar to leaving the public schools. Now it's nice to get stuff cheaply and it's nice to get stuff free for your pocketbook, but actually in terms of health, it's actually the worst option and you want to make capitalism work. So being in the free market and staying in the free market is your uh, ultimate goal. And a lot of people are finding that. They're finding other solutions to healthcare problems. The, Right, you pick your doctors, right, so picking your doctor is an important thing. If you go with an insurance company, you're locked into your network. If you go with the government, half of the doctors aren't taking Medicaid or Medicare anymore, so you're scuppered. So you're, you're in a situation where if you have cash, then you're, you've got the, the best option. Now, sure, it's not easy, but what we're seeing is a reduction. When you go out with cash, the actual prices, if you do shopping, uh, shop around and what people are doing. There's a, 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 a web page, Medibed, I think it's called, and you can go shop. And, and if say you have to have a, a hip surgery, you can go online and doctors will bid for your surgery. If you go to the hospital, they'll tell you it's $90,000 to get hip replacement. If you go this route, you'll get quotes from all over the world, including, as I've learned on that subject, $7,000 in Taiwan. When you go to Taiwan, it's a friendly, happy to see your doctor who's trained in America and is very competent and they have a great facility. So that's a great option, and you've completely wrecked the system for the people that want you to pay the $90, $90,000. So that's how it will work. Um, you can go to Mexico, you can do amazing things. Cash is a great opportunity. And, and the, the truth is, is that healthcare isn't that expensive for a lot of things. If you start going out there and shopping, the prices are radically different than the hidden prices in the hospitals. Yes, you at the back, sir. Yeah, a question on indoctrination. I haven't seen the film yet, so I don't know when it was uh, made, but I'm uh, just wondering what uh, your experts in the film thought about Common Core. Um, we don't prioritize in Common Core. I'm a little bit tired of it, honestly, because it's sort of a, it is an issue, an issue of centralized government control over Edu the education system, but it's almost like Obamacare. So in our, both of our films uh, with Obamacare in relation to healthcare, we didn't want to focus on that because the illusion is if you do away with Obamacare, we've fixed the problem, which we totally haven't. The same thing with Common Core is there's a lot about Common Core and a lot of you know schools, we're not going to send Johnny to do the Common Core standardized tests. And I'm kind of like, well, you send them for everything else, <laughs> you know, so you've totally acquiesced completely with the system, but you're thrown off at about Common Core. The problem is I think one of the, the Common Core has leveraged because it's one of those politically fixable fa uh, things that would give an illusion of success. I would love to see Common Core go away, but I want to see all the public schools burned down and all the teachers fired, so. <laughs> so that's why you should vote, vote for me for the school board. Uh, <laughs> yes. Standardized testing, which Common Core really is, the yeah. system name for it, has been going on for years. Yeah, it's always been there, and if you get rid of it, it'll be renamed, it'll be something else. It's protocol, so you train people with whatever it is. The name goes away, it's not a success, and the truth is, public schools aren't fixable. 
get your kids out, that's the only answer. And with Obamacare, it's true as well. The truth is, is the Republicans participated in Obamacare in a real way. What happened was the Heritage Foundation had the idea to oppose Hillary Care, that was mandates. So they saw that as the, the capitalist solution to Hillary Care's public option, which obviously is a terrible idea. So the Heritage Foundation came up with this uh, so-called antithetical idea, which was mandate people buy insurance, and a lot of Republicans supported it, and you, Gingrich, Gingrich supported it, and of course Romney Care actually got together with Gruber, you know the stupidity of the American people guy, well Romney got in a room with him and invented Romney Care, and then all the Republicans went out and voted for him, for president. Now, no, no. <laughs> now, the, there's there, there's lack of discernment on both sides. So the activists, the ones who understand this issue, should be very vigilant because there's so many false successes and politically speaking that will be hailed. So I know that if we say, oh, you know, the Republicans won the presidency, we'll get rid of Obamacare. Well, you know, they're never going to touch all the other programs that are there. You know, they used to be against the Department of Education. It used to be policy in the Republican Party to dismantle the Department of Education, but they threw that out in the 90s. And I think it, because Obamacare will become so prevalent that it's going to be another entitlement, it's going to be really hard to take away from the American people. But they're going to, someone's going to have to start ratcheting it in because it doesn't work long term. And as we say in the film, single payers coming down the line as well as probably a solution. Yes, sir. Uh, have you heard of the Oklahoma Medical Center that offers a free market alternative? Yeah, he's in the movie. It is, it's yes, <laughs> Keith Smith is unbelievable. I mean, I, it's along with Jules uh, Magical, who's the smiling doctor in our movie, because she doesn't work for the government. Uh, he's the other guy that smiles in our film a whole lot because he's been remarkably successful about bringing a free market option to people. And people fly, as we show in the film, they fly down from Canada, socialized medicine, to get the surgery done that they need right then, or they want right then, whether they need it or not. I mean, if you've got a hip that needs fixed, you kind of want it fixed. You know, you want to wait two years in Canada and hobble around with a frame, or you want to go to Oklahoma, pay a decent amount. So what the, the whole story of Keith Smith is amazing. He worked for the hospital system, realized what a scam it is, which it is, you know, the whole fraud of uh, not-for-profit when they really are for-profit and getting big money from the government too. The, he left the system and put all of his prices online. He has a website and you can go click on all of the body parts and it's kind of fun and weird to do it, but you can go and find out what all the things cost. And that's groundbreaking and what we, our solution in the film in relation to that is price transparency. You know, the crazy thing about healthcare, it's the only place in the, in the American market where you buy something without caring about the price. I'm sure a lot of government employees when they buy stuff don't care about the price. It's that issue of other people's money. But in terms of us, you and I, when we have insurance or we have the government paying for healthcare, we don't care about cost. And the doctor who's selling his medical services doesn't even know the cost of some of the things that he's selling. There's nothing like that, which is why we use this analogy in the film of the, the simplicity of what healthcare should be, which is the diner, where you go in, you order your medical services, are delivered to you at a, a reasonable price, there's competition, but there's price transparency, and that's what Keith Smith is a genius for doing, for restoring medical liberty in that way. So, any more questions? If not, I think, yo, yes. Uh, in regards to like uh, the marriage issue, uh, family life, I believe Dennis, Dennis Rainey is talking about where they're getting together pastors that are going to start taking marriage back into the churches where the, they're going to do covenant marriages. Okay. And Dr. Dobson actually was talking about it again this, this week as well. Um, have you heard anything? I don't know anything about that. Oh, okay. Our first film is on... That would be an interesting documentary. Oh, it's a documentary idea? Oh, yeah. Wow. Got because, three, but... We've got a documentary on that They're issue. They're realizing that they've lost the, the, the war or the battle within the government system with the marriages <laughs> issue. Right. There's a good documentary that just came out uh, by a friend of mine, Janet Porter, called Love Wins. If you can go get that, it's on the homosexual marriage issue. And it's really, really good. I like the subject. We, our first film, Shaky Town, was about San Francisco homosexual politics back in 2003 when they first enacted homosexual marriage in, in San Francisco, where I was living near San Francisco at the time. So that was our first film. So it's a, yeah, it's a good subject. That one. I haven't seen that yeah. One. There's another one put out. Um, uh, Dr. Dobson interviewed the gentleman three days in a row. I mean, it, it was like an hour and a half. They right. set it up, and, and he has a movie. 
documentary out as well where he was a homosexual. Oh, he yeah, right. He became uh -huh. a Christian. Right. And he has okay. two hours where he interviews Dr. Uh, David Porter. Mm, it was on Southwest. Was that it? Yes, it was on Southwest Radio. That's what it was, not Dr. Dobson's show. Okay, very good. And it was a very good one. Excellent. Okay, I think we're going to close. Senator Baxter, if you can come up. <laughs> Jeff, anybody can take this. Okay. I'm not on here, John. Here we are. Uh, I want to first of all thank John and Cecily for putting this on. They have done it entirely on themselves. I don't. I don't get any credit for this. I just get to stand up here and blubber for a minute or two. But we owe a great debt of honor and gratitude to John and Cecily Charleston, so give them one last hand, please. <laughs> I've got a couple of options here that uh, Cindy Marshall gave me. Christian Health Care Ministries. I've got a brochure on this. It's actually a packet. And also Samaritan Ministries. Uh, I know Colin Gunn and myself are both on, my family is on uh, Samaritan Ministries. We've been on it for, uh, let me think here, 16 years. And I was a skeptic. Diane, my wife, was an insurance licensed uh, insurance agent. And so she was big in insurance. And when I said I refused to pay the premiums, especially when I found out what they were going for back in 1999, roughly, is when the year was, I quit paying, but I started looking for options. I ran across Samaritan Ministries. And we've used it a number of times. And the only challenges that we've had with Samaritan Ministries is that they've actually three separate times overpaid us to where we were supposed to get, let's just say $15,000. We actually got $15,500. Another time it was like $20,000 and we got like $20,600. Another time it was like $40,000 and we got $42,000. So that's the only uh, mistake that they've done, but it's on the positive side, not on the negative side. So I'm, I'm a believer in these ministries, folks. So anyway, I have a couple packets here. Thank you for coming tonight, and I don't need to say anything else, but uh, the future's looking good with other options.